Hi friends, we're building a language server from scratch and today we're building out hover integration testing and I've even got a few exercises for you to sort of prove your knowledge. Let's go. It's time to add some tests. Building on episode two where we built diagnostics and code actions, I've put up PR2, which adds initial integration tests. There are three tests and one of them is intentionally failing. I'll note one more thing, which is I'm pulling in VS Code language server purely for the authoritative types so that we can assert against them in our tests and make sure that we don't have skew from the official spec. From our server directory, we can run the tests with npm test. And we see that there was a failure. Two tests pass. We can initialize and give completion. We can do spelling suggestions, but we cannot shut down and exit properly. The reason for this is that we're not implementing the two methods required here, namely shut down and exit. Your challenge will be to implement those methods so that this test passes. You can run the tests in watch mode with npm test space dash dash space dash dash watch. Press A to run all tests and then you can obviously just run failing tests and so on. But now as we make changes, we'll immediately get that feedback in our tests. Let's briefly look at how the tests work. Here's our server test.ts. I'm choosing not to organize these tests in a meaningful way yet. They're all in one file. So as you can see at the top, we're importing current working directory from process, and then we're importing our typical jest methods. We are then importing some types for our assertions, and then we're importing language server wrapper, which is some custom code that we'll talk about in a moment. Language server wrapper is set up as an uninitialized variable on line 12. We have a default file. We have a wait function that we define, and then we have some helpers. So init is a little test helper that fires off an initialized request to the language server. You'll remember that initialize is the first request that the client must send before the language server can respond with anything. And we give it empty capabilities and a project root. We then keep track of document versions and can fire off some did change events via our did change helper. You'll see starting on line 30 that it is a notification. We just send off this method with the changes. We then have a completion request helper which can request completions at a certain position for a certain file. Hopefully this feels pretty straightforward. In our before each, we set up the language server and we give it the command and the arguments. Our command is npx and our arguments are ts node and then the path to our TypeScript file. If we set the invar verbose, then our language server wrapper will run in verbose mode. We then start the language server. After each test, we stop the language server. Let's look at our first test, can initialize and give completions. First, we await the initialized message. The await here ensures that we get a response before we do anything. Then we fire off a did change to specify that a document has the content hello world and then the letter A. When we ask for completions at the point after the letter A, we see that on line 72, we expect those completions to be incomplete and that we then expect the first five of those completions to be what is mentioned here. Once we update the content to be hello world AA and then request a completion after the second A, we are able to assert that we expect the completions to be complete. Is incomplete is now false because we can give an exhaustive list of completions. And then we assert what they are. So the testing here should be pretty straightforward. There's a test down in here for spelling and then more important to your interest, there's this test for can shut down and exit. Here, we assert that when we send shut down, we get a null response. And after waiting 20 milliseconds, the language server process is still running. Next, we can send the exit notification. And after waiting 20 milliseconds, we expect that the language server has exited. As you can see, our watch has rerun after we change the test name. Just going to do a git add on that file and then do a git amend and then force push to that branch so that everything looks the same.
let's take a brief look at the wrapper. The language server wrapper does probably what you would expect. Its goal is to spawn a child process. So in our constructor, we take the commands and the args, and then we can also take verbose. You'll see on line six that we have a request ID. This will be incremented every time we make a request. And then request handlers will associate a request ID to a promise resolver so that when we get a response, we can fire that resolver. This means that back over in our tests, we can do things like the await here and know that we will have a response before we continue on in our tests. Start will spawn the process and then call the listen method. We have some error handling that we don't really need to concern ourselves with right now. Stop will set verbose mode to false because we now have an expected exit and then send a kill. Listen is going to look a lot like code we've already written. This is reading over standard in, looking for full messages, and then handling those once we have a full message. That handling happens down here on line 67. So if the message has an ID and we have a request handler associated with that message ID, then we might log out some verbose console. But most importantly, we will call the resolver for that request handler with the result of the message. So if you imagine our initialize request, we send our initialize request to the server. We store a request handler associated with that ID. Then when we get the response back, we get that request handler and we take the result from that response the server has given us and we invoke the resolver. Then we delete our resolver from the request handlers. Finally, we remove the message from the buffer again, as you've seen before. The notify function is a fire and forget, so we just write out to the language server standard in our JSON RPC message. Here in request, we're incrementing our request ID on line 107. We're writing out our message, and then down here on line 123, we're setting up our request handler for the promise. There's code to make the JSON RPC message, and that's it. If you look at the language server spec documentation, you should have everything that you need to make this test pass. That's your first challenge. Pause the video now and make it happen. Hopefully you found that a straightforward challenge. Let's quickly implement it together so that we can make sure we're on the same page. We see that we need to support the shutdown request and the exit notification. Let's look at the docs. The shutdown request is sent from the client to the server. It asks the server to shut down, but not to exit. There's a separate exit notification that asks the server to exit. So the request is method shutdown with params none, and the response is a result of null. It could have an error if there was an exception that happens during the shutdown request. But in our case, we just need to return null. We'll open up our server.ts, and in our method lookup, we'll add shutdown. Let's keep these in alphabetical order. This will live alongside initialize in our method folder. So we'll make a new file here, shutdown.ts. We will export const shutdown. We don't care about the params, and we're just going to return null. Back in our server, we can now import shutdown. And if we look at our failing tests, we're failing not on the shutdown request, but on the assertion that the process is exited after the exit notification. We need to implement exit. Back in our docs, exit is right beneath shutdown request, so we'll scroll down just a little bit. This is a notification, so it expects no response. It sends the method exit with no params. If we're successful at shutting down, we should exit with code zero, otherwise code one. We see that our test is expecting code zero, so we just need to make this work. Over here, we'll add exit, and it is going to live alongside shutdown and initialize. And we'll do export const exit is going to take no params, and it will do process.exit zero. Back over in our initialize, we need to import this. And now our test pass.
Next, we'll implement text document hover. Hover is a great way to give your users additional information and context about what they're looking at. Most clients support Markdown, so you can pull in rich content for your definitions, your documentation, and anything else you want to show to the user. Our definitions on hover will look like this. We hover over a word and it shows the definition, just as you would expect. Chunks is apparently not in the dictionary here. Let's look for words. Words are. And this works in NeoVim as well. To get definitions, we'll use the command line program dict. Here we're getting the definition for programming and we're requesting it from a single dictionary, WordNet. There's one definition found. That's because it only used one dictionary. It says that from WordNet, we're getting the following entry. And then we have programming with two different definitions. To format this for our hover, we'll strip out the first four lines and then do a little massaging on the formatting. We'll start by writing a failing test. At the bottom of our server test.ts, we'll start writing our new test. We'll call it test hover definitions. And we will make it an async test because we want to wait on responses. The first thing we'll do is await init to make sure we're initialized. And then we'll fire a did change to specify that we have a file with the content functional programming is a thing. No matter how you feel about functional programming, you can't deny that. We should make a definition request. And that will be language server wrapper dot request. And here we should look at our docs. If we go to language features and scroll down a little bit, we'll find hover. Hover, as you expect at this point, has client capabilities and server capabilities. So at some point we'll need to specify that we're a hover provider for this to work, but we're just doing the failing test now. So let's keep going. We scroll down and we see that the request is to text document hover and we pass some hover params. Hover params extend text document position params and work progress params. We're only going to care about the position params. So we'll start by copying this and hopping back over to our editor, paste this in, and then we'll start giving it some position params. Text document position params include a text document identifier. So text document and then URI and then the documents URI and then a position. So text document is going to be URI with default file that's specified above. Let's see that it's just a string to a fake file. And then position, we're going to want to get the definition for programming from this string. So we'll have a line of zero and a character of, hmm, it's the best way to do this. Let's open a new file. Okay, so it starts on character 12. So we'll just say character 14 to kind of put it somewhere in the middle of it. Character 14. Excellent. Now we should have an expected body. So const expected definition body will be, and we'll make this a big long string. So now we'll copy the definition from WordNet and then we'll do our editing. So as mentioned, we don't want the top here. We will move programming over and then we'll make it a markdown header by underlining it. For these, we'll shift them over until they are completely left aligned. And then I don't love the way that there's some space here, so we're just gonna fix that as well. Okay, that seems reasonable. Additionally, we'll add a line break here, and then we will do a trim on the end. So now we have an expected definition. If everything goes well, this is what our hover should give us. That's the body. The expected hover content, though, is going to be const expected hover which is going to be of type hover will be that. We will import this from the VS Code language server so we can assert against the official types. Okay, so what's in a hover? Let's look back at the spec. We'll go back to the hover 
and we have hover params. Okay, so response is a hover or null. Hover is contents and then the content and then a range, which is optional. I like to have the range though, because it can be, as it says here, used to help visualize a hover. And it's just kind of an interesting thing to implement in this case. So we're gonna go with markup content, which is a kind and then a value. So contents is in kind and value, and then range, we know what a range is. We'll do markdown. And then our value is going to be expected definition body. Range, so the range specifies the content that is triggering this hover. So it will have a start of line zero, character, let's try 12 here. And then an end, you know what? Actually, let's, let's do a new thing here and just double check. It should start on character 12 and go to character 22. And now we just need to make our assertion. So we're going to expect the definition request. Actually, you know what? That should be definition response. We'll rename it to strict equal our expected hover. Let's rename this real quick. Excellent. So now we can run our tests. We have a failure and that's because rather than getting any of this back, we got a promise. So what that means is the response did not resolve. So what we need to do is to actually await this. All right, so now we have a failure that makes sense, which is we're timing out. And that's because our promise is never getting resolved. And that's because the server does not implement this. All right, your challenge is to implement hover. I'll push this up as challenge-2 and you can pull it down and do it and pause the video right here. How did that go? I hope it went well. Let's implement it together. Over in our server, we're going to start by adding in the text document hover support. We'll map that to a function hover, which we haven't added yet. Since this is a text document method, we'll implement it alongside of completion and our other text document methods. So we'll just open up completion and make a new file as a neighbor, hover.ts. And we're going to export const hover. It's going to take a message, which is of type request message. And it's going to return a hover or null. We can import this from our server, and then we will implement hover for ourselves in just a moment. Back in our server, we can now add this import, and our server is happy now. All right, so what is a hover made up of? Well, we know that from our test. So if we hop over to our test, we can see that a hover looks like this. So we're gonna grab this. We'll paste this here. So we have contents, which in our case are always gonna be of a kind markdown, so that's fine. This is going to be a string. This is going to be a range. Just need to import range from our types, and this is happy. Now the problem is that we're not returning a hover or a null. We want to return a hover that is the definition of the word under the cursor. 
So the first thing that we need to do is actually figure out what the word under the cursor is. We'll start by writing the code that we wish we had. We'll say const current word is going to be word under cursor for our document. Well, okay, we do need a document, so let's figure out what that looks like. Let's say const params is going to be message.params as hover params. Okay, so now we need to figure out what hover params are. We should have those in our test too. We do, they look like this. So we're gonna hop up here and do type hover params. It's going to be this. URI is going to be a document URI. Excellent. And the position is going to be a position. Excellent. So now we need to get our document. Const document is going to be documents.get params.text document .uri. And then if not document, we will return null. We can't help you if we don't have any content. That seems reasonable. We do need to import documents. Great. And now we need to build out word under cursor. Assuming that we got a word under cursor back, what do we want it to look like? Well, our return should have a definition. That's not something we're gonna get from the word under the cursor. That's something we'll get from shelling out to dict. But it also has a range. So it might be nice to get the range of the word under the cursor back. So let's say that current word is going to come back with a range and the word text itself. So that will give us what we need to specify the range of the word and the word itself so we can get the definition of the word. Hmm. So now the question is, how do we get the word under the cursor from the position? I want this function to live in documents because it feels like a very documenty thing to do. And if it's going to live in documents, then we might as well just take a document URI here. So let's make a quick change here, and then we'll move this all up into documents. Okay, so over in documents, we'll do export word under cursor is going to be a function which takes a URI, which is a document URI, it's going to return a word under cursor or null if we can't find the document. Then we will say const document is going to be documents.get URI. If not document, return null. We need to define what word under cursor is. Word under cursor is going to be the text, which is our word. I don't want to call it word again because that gets pretty redundant. And then a range, which is our range. We'll need to import range from our types. And now uh, we need a return statement at the end here to return our word under cursor object. Our function also needs the position. It's hard to get the word under the cursor without the location of the cursor. We'll import that from our types, and then we will make sure that we're passing it in. So assuming that we had a position, a position we know is made up of a line and a character. So we'll break out our lines. And the line that we're working with is going to be lines position dot line. To find the starting character, we can do const start is going to be line dot last index of. So we're going to look for a space character. This may be a little naive, but I think it'll work for our purposes. And then position dot character. And then we'll do plus one. We're finding the space before our position in this line and then adding one so that we're starting at where the, the word actually begins. End is going to be line.index of space. 
starting at position.character. It's possible that we don't have a space at the end, and it's possible that we don't have a space at the beginning. If there is not a space at the beginning, last index of will be negative one. So when we add one to that, we'll just be starting at zero. That works out great. If the end is negative one though, we need to account for that. So if end triple equals negative one, then we're going to return text, which will be line.slice from the start, getting all the way to the end because we don't have an end. The range will be start of line position dot line character is going to be the start and then the end is going to be line position dot line and the character will be line dot length and that should make sure we get everything if we do have an end then we can return text is going to be line dot slice start end range will be start line of position dot line character of start and then the end is going to be the same thing except the end ah Small typo there, and it looks like we're good to go. So back in our hover, we need to make sure that we pass in our params.position. And now we should get a current word after we import word under cursor. Current word is either the word under cursor type or null. So if not current word, we're going to return null. We can't help you. Let's return a mock hover right now just to see if things work. So we're going to return contents and we're just going to return the kind of markdown value of current word dot text. We know that's wrong, but we're going to see how it fits. The range will be current word dot range. Now we should hopefully get a useful test failure. Let's give it a try. Ah, it looks like we have a compilation error now in our server.ts. Let's fix that. That's right. So the return type here is not something we know about. We'll just add it into this list. Now our tests look a little bit happier. We still have the one failure that we expect, and that's because we're missing our definition. And it looks like we're also off on our position. So instead of the actual definition, we just have the word under the cursor. That's expected. We're not using the dictionary yet. But our start is actually incorrect. The problem is not actually a bug, but rather a problem with how I was thinking about things. So in text editors, the First line is line one, and the first character is character one. In position params and in JavaScript's index, everything is zero based. So when I was looking at 12 here, it actually should be 11. For the ending, I was counting the actual end character itself. So the 22 is correct, just the start is wrong. If we lower this by one, our test failure should now just be the content. And that's what we see, excellent. Let's get the actual definition in here. Over in hover, we now have the current word, so we can fetch out the definition. We want to do some massaging, so we'll assign the result of dict to raw definition. We're going to use spawn sync, and we'll give it dict. The next argument is going to be the current word dot text. Then we will have dash d w n and we'll specify our encoding let's go to utf 8. okay we'll import spawn sync from child process we'll want to do a standard out to get the actual content 
and then call trim on it. I know we want to do some massaging, but let's just see what the difference is right now. Okay, so we have programming, the one definition found header. We don't have our markdown and we don't have our indentions correct. That should be fairly straightforward to fix. So we'll say const value, which is what we're going to pass in down here, is going to be current word dot text. Then we'll do the dash character and repeat it for current word dot length. If you're wondering why I'm not just using the pound symbol to specify this as a header, it's because not every editor will support markdown. So in that case, they will render it as plain text and the dashes underneath just look a little cleaner there. So here we'll add in the raw definition. Hmm, I guess we should split it. So we'll do a splice on that to drop the first five lines. That will be all the header content. It should be text. This should be getting us a little bit closer. Oh, cool. So now we don't start failing until we get down to the actual definitions themselves. Great. Now we'll map over our lines. So the line will do a simple replace and it's going to be a bunch of spaces. So I'll just actually copy this out. I think it's that many. We'll replace it with nothing. Let's see how that helps. Hmm. Ah, so we are starting in the right place, but the problem is that our formatting is all messed up since we don't have line breaks and we're also not joining. Okay, so let's join on new line and trim at the end here. This should give us better formatting. We're also going to change this to only run failed tests to give us a little tighter feedback loop. It is not doing that because, oh, it's only test suites. Let's go to our test here then and we'll, since it's only running failed test suites, we'll slap an only on this. Perfect. We need a line before the first definition and after the end of the first definition. We'll map again. We'll take a line. And if the line starts with a space, then we're just going to return the line. Otherwise, we'll return a new line plus the line. And I think that will help a little bit. Let's see where we're at. Okay, so the problem now is that the indention of scheduling is a little weird. Let's just take a quick look over here. So the indention of creating is fine. Ah, I see. So the in here is causing an interesting behavior. If we do a double space there, does that help? Now the only problem is that we're missing one line break. So we can just add another line break here. And everything passes. We'll get rid of our only. and all of our tests pass. Excellent. The test pass, but the functionality doesn't actually work yet. In NeoVim, we get a helpful warning. Method text document hover is not supported by any of the servers registered for the current buffer. We need to update our initialize method. Initialize now needs to specify that we're a hover provider. What value do we use for hover provider? We'll check the docs. We will look for initialize under lifecycle, and then we'll search for hover provider. And we can either do just true, or we can specify some hover options, which extend, yeah, we just wanna do true. If we re-edit our text file, and we make a small change, 
we now see that we can indeed get definitions. Let's commit these changes. There is a small bug in this implementation that you can fix if you're so inclined. I'm going to leave it as an exercise to the reader, but I'll quickly show you what it is. If in our test we have functional programming, comma, is it a thing, then when we look at our definition, our hover is going to include the comma. The definition itself is fine. Dict does the right thing there but we're passing in programming comma, and the thing that will be underlined is programming comma. There are multiple ways to deal with this, and I'll let you decide if and how you wish to deal with it. In the meantime, we'll just stash that and move on. There is one necessary change before we move on. When we first open a document, we don't get diagnostics and we can't hover on things. Once we make an edit, everything works as expected. But until then, our document store doesn't know about the current document. This is because we're implementing did change, but not did open. Let's quickly implement did open. Looking at the spec, we can see that under document synchronization, there is a did open text document notification. It is a notification with the method text document did open and it gives us some did open text document params that are defined as follows. We'll grab those as well. We will start with a failing test. So everywhere in our tests, we're using did change. And the first did change in a test should actually be a did open. So we'll just make that change now. That one's an update, so did change is great. Did open, did open, and good. Did open should look a lot like did change because we still want to manage versions. So what we're going to do is copy the method and then we will make some changes. Did open, same arguments. The only thing that's going to change is our method name and our params. So did open won't have content changes because changes represent an update, an actual change. This is just the initial content. So if we look at our docs, we see we're sending text, it did open text document params, which is a text document, which has a URI, language ID, version, and text. We don't really need the language ID, so I'm just gonna set the text here, and then we'll get rid of it here. Great. So now our test should be failing because when we issue our request to get content related to the buffer. We don't know what the buffer's content is because we're sending uh, did open. Our server doesn't know how to act on that message, so it doesn't do anything. And so anytime we try to interact with the buffer content, the document content, there's nothing there. So now we just need to hop in our server and implement did open. It will live alongside did change. and we'll just specify it as a method that doesn't exist yet. Since it lives alongside did change, we'll just make a new file here, did open.ts, and we'll export const did open. It's going to take a message, which is a notification message, and it's going to not return anything because it is a notification. import that from our server. Back over in our server, we will now do the import for this. So server should be good. Our tests are still going to fail because we're not doing anything with the did open content yet. And then this is going to be URI string. The URI is a document URI. Let's just grab all this. Number. Great. So now what we need to do is to say const params is going to be message.params as 
did open text document params. Awesome. Then we'll do documents.set. So we need to import our documents here. So set is going to take the params.textdocument.uri and then params.textdocument.text. Hooray, our tests are green. And more importantly, now when we open a new document, we should get diagnostics right off the bat and our hover should work right off the bat. Excellent. Thanks for joining me for another video. I hope you had some fun. I'm certainly proud of what we built together. I think at this point I'm going to push pause on the LSP from scratch approach. I feel like we've sort of run its course. My original goal was to demystify these concepts so that you would feel comfortable just sitting down with only your computer and no dependencies, be able to read the language server protocol spec and implement these things yourself. I still have plenty of language server content I want to share, but moving away from the from scratch approach will let us really focus on the exciting uses and things we can do with the protocol rather than getting bogged down in the implementation details. Hopefully those details are demystified for you now and you feel comfortable going as low level as you need to, but we can spend a little bit more time building interesting things. I'm curious, did you enjoy the challenges? Are they a good fit for a video like this or do you just gloss over them? Let me know down in the comments. Finally, I wanted to mention that I'm currently offering 30 minutes of free meeting time just to discuss whatever you want to talk about in terms of the language server protocol and language servers. Book some time. I may not have all the answers, but we'll try to figure it out together. It can be fun. Thanks again for watching.